Uh, at this point, we're going to call the meeting to order. If I could ask those of you that stand in up back, we can't have the aisles blocked. There are seats around. It won't matter at this point because we're short for seats. If you have to squeeze in where some of the retirees are sitting or whatever, or if you can stand along the back and the side just so that uh, we don't run into any, uh, any problems with uh, complaints. Uh, would everybody please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, which is the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's the guy over in the front corner. Who is he? That's the guy over there. Oh, the car. Oh, yeah? I just seen him. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to start off tonight uh, thanking everybody that came. It's nice to see so many old friends, not putting emphasis on the word old. Uh, it's just nice to see you. Um, we'll start off with introductions so that everybody knows uh, who's who. And uh, we'll start at the far end of the table with Julie, if you just introduce yourself. Julie Serpinot, the business manager. Uh, Vinnie Cloutier. Heather Messier. Josh Cote. Kevin Hayes. And I'm Dr. Ted Malvey, the interim school superintendent. Chris King. Kurt Nordquist. And uh, if uh, our school council and uh, insurance uh, uh, consultants would introduce themselves as well. Um, good evening. My name is Kimberly Rosak with the law firm of Myrick O'Connell. Good evening. My name is Kevin O'Keefe from Axial Benefits Group. And my name is Mick Rogers from Axial as well. Thank you. At this point, uh, we'll call the hearing uh, to order. Uh, proper notice was given uh, that there would be a public hearing uh, on today's date at this time and place at uh, Wire Village. And all retirees, the participants uh, in our insurance program have been uh, duly notified. Um, before we begin, um, I would just like to take the opportunity to clear up any misinformation or misunderstandings that may have resulted from the notice that was sent out or from any uh, rumors or statements that you may have heard uh, from people uh, in and about. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the district has no intention of eliminating every, anybody's health insurance, uh, nor do we have any intention of reducing anybody's coverage or to make changes in your coverage or benefits. This hearing is the first step in a multi-step process that will allow us to place current retirees <coughs> who are in the GIC plan into our own district plan where we will have better control over plan designs and costs. At this date and time, GIC has control over both of those issues. Currently, we have approximately 70 non-teacher retirees who are in the district plan. The larger this group becomes, the more we can drive costs down and pass that savings on to the district uh, for the education of the children. At the same time, we'll bring equity across the board to all our retirees, uh, both teachers and non-teachers. Given the financial crisis of the community, coupled with the rising cost of operating the district, we are constantly being asked from year to year to do more with less. At this point, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. We foresee no increases in school revenue that will allow us to continue on this current path. In fact, it's going the other way. And our grant revenue and other revenue <coughs> we have from the state and from the federal governments continue to decline. Unless we move now and do something in the way of cost containment measures, we may very well reach the point where we have to ask you folks to come back here in a year or two, and then we will be facing that dreaded decision as to whether benefits can continue or not. None of us want that to happen, and that's why we're taking the action that we're taking now. So I ask you tonight to put all your emotions aside, all of us, and to listen with an open mind to the presentations that will may be made to you by insurance consultants. At the conclusion of their presentations, I will open the hearing to questions from retirees. After all retirees have an opportunity to ask their questions, I will then open it up to the general public for anyone else that wishes to make a comment or to have a question. I will give 
all opportunity to retirees to ask any questions that they have. I'll ask you to please try not to be redundant. If you, the question you want to ask has already been answered, uh, please pass and, and wait for another opportunity or if you have another question. And I would ask for those people that aren't retirees that you not try to um, uh, have input into the meeting until I call for the end of the retirees' input, and then I'll open it up to the rest of you. Uh, having said that, at this point, I would like to introduce uh, insurance consultants uh, to provide you with a presentation. We're going to move out of here so that we won't be in the way, and you'll be able to see the uh, presentation. Put your mic down. Yeah, just put your mic. Just put this down. Yeah. Oh, Oops. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, everybody. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Kevin O'Keefe. My company name is Axial Benefits Group. Here with me this evening is my partner, Mick Rogers. As far as the agenda goes, you can see that we've just had the opening remarks. And as part of the, the overview, what I will be doing in this portion of the discussion, we'll be talking specifically about the plans that are currently being offered through the GIC to the retired teachers, that being the medical insurance, the uh, dental insurance and the life insurance. Uh, we will also discuss in this presentation the information uh, as to the plans that will be made available uh, through Spencer East Brookfield Regional School District. When we're talking specifically about the medical plans, we're going to look at it from two different uh, directions, if you will. We are going to be looking at the Medicare plan options. So there is a group of retirees that have access to Medicare, both parts A and B. They're on a Medicare supplement plan, so we'll be looking at those plans specifically. But what we'll also be doing is looking at the non-Medicare programs. There are a number of retired teachers who are early retirees that haven't reached age 65 as of yet and therefore not eligible for Medicare. Or there could be some retirees who, in fact, are not eligible for Medicare even after the age of 65 because they have not paid into Social Security. So we'll be speaking directly on that. After this portion of the presentation, we'll, as the chairman has uh, stated, we'll look to receive comments from the retirees. Uh, we'll also look for public comment, at which point after that, the, the public hearing will be closed. And then we will ask for a non-binding vote from the retirees, a standing vote. And then after that, we'll have the school committee discussion. Okay, to lay out the timeline, this evening we are holding our public hearing. We are going to ask that the retired teachers uh, vote on the proposal to revoke Mass General Laws Chapter 32B, Section 11E, which is the, uh, the vehicle where the retired teachers uh, have their health plan options. If approved, the school committee is under some tight timelines as directed by the GIC, by the state. We must notify them no later than April 1st, so it's right upon us. And that would be for a July 1st effective date for plans to be uh, available. If approved, the retirees would be advised shortly of open enrollments. Uh, and that, during that process, you will be provided detailed plan information, cost information, how to go through the election process for the products that we'll discuss, and new ID cards will be mailed uh, prior to the July 1st effective date. And on July 1st, again, 2014, the new plans would be effective. So how will this impact you? That's everybody's big question, of course. As we look at the health insurance component here, we see that the GIC currently offers plan options whether you are a Medicare enrollee or a non-Medicare enrollee, as I just mentioned. In this scenario, the state, the GIC, controls the carrier options, who's going to be made available to you, the plan options, and the costs. The district has no control over this at all. The state does. The district, however, also offers plan options, whether you are a Medicare enrollee or a non-Medicare enrollee as well. So we are not looking to take away options, as was just commented. 
Changing to the district plans will not change your requirement to enroll in Medicare when first eligible. So if you become eligible for Medicare upon reaching age 65, it is expected, it is required that you enroll in Medicare. If you are not entitled to Medicare because you have not contributed to Social Security, we understand that's a valid reason. So there are options available there as well. There will continue to be options available there. We will also have plan options whether you live in Massachusetts or outside of Massachusetts. Everybody will have a plan option available to him or her. Now, we are going to look specifically at the Medicare enrollees, those people who are currently covered by the GIC that have both Medicare Part A and B. Currently, the GIC has an HMO plan, or currently a couple of HMO plans. For our specific audience, we have the Fallon Senior Plan being made available, and we also have the Tufts Medicare Preferred. You live in the service area under these programs, and you go to designated providers, doctors. How many retirees currently are in this plan? Based on the GIC enrollment that they've provided to us, there are 20 retirees in one of these two programs, most in the Fountain uh, Senior Plan. We also have indemnity products. Indemnity is a product which is really a freedom of choice type plan. You're not restricted to certain doctor access, if you will. Uh, this is where we have the bulk of the Medicare retirees. We have 88 folks uh, in this program. And here we have the Unicare Medicare Extension Program. A retiree can live out of state under this program. Again, remember that this is for Medicare enrollees, those people who have access to Medicare Part A and B. So we have a combined total of 108 people in that program, in those programs, the vast majority covered through the indemnity program. So, as a Medicare enrollee for these individuals that we're talking about right now, what are your plan options through Spencer East Brookfield Regional School District? Well, two plan options will be made available to you. Both are offered by Blue Cross and Blue Shield. The first is MedEx Bronze. This is a product already offered to some retirees, to the non-teachers, the retirees, as part of the district. The MedEx Pro Bronze Plan is that freedom of choice plan. It's a Medicare supplement plan that allows you to live in Massachusetts or outside of Massachusetts. This is a phenomenal program that Blue Cross and Blue Shield offers and it's currently available today. Also available will be an HMO. If an individual prefers to have an HMO, so we talked about you have the Fallon Senior Plan made available to you today through the GIC. A couple of people who are on the Fallon Senior Plan, if they want to maintain an HMO, the HMO Blue for Seniors plan is available here. This is the statewide HMO. Uh, it's been well publicized that certain doctor groups have backed out of the Fallon Senior Plan. That has caused disruption for some people probably in our audience. The HMO Blue for Seniors program is a statewide HMO. That doctor group that has been taken out of the Fallon Senior Plan is part of this program. So if you are impacted and perhaps lost your doctor, great news. The Senior Program will have those doctors back. All of the doctors are in the MedEx Bronze Plan as well, so great news there. So those are the Medicare options that we just talked about. We have freedom of choice, indemnity plans available to you. You can live inside or outside of Massachusetts. We have an HMO Blue for Seniors program. If you are a Massachusetts, uh, uh, Massachusetts resident, you can have access to the HMO Blue for Seniors product if you choose that platform. Now, speaking specifically regarding non-Medicare enrollees, the individuals who are early retirees perhaps, not age 65 yet, or perhaps age 65 or after that uh, or who are not eligible for uh, Social Security. Under this program here, the current GIC plans for the HMO, we have the Fallon Select or Direct Care Programs. Fallon is, of course, one of the very well-known insurance companies here in the area. You must live under these HMO programs. You must live in the service area, uh, really, which is statewide, and you must use the network providers. Under the HMO, 
we have 40 retirees in this program, some under the age of 65, some over the age of 65. In the GIC, there is also the Unicare Indemnity Plan, that freedom of choice plan. You don't have a service area requirement there. How many people are in this plan? 23. The vast majority of Massachusetts residents. So those are the plans offered to non-Medicare enrollees through the GIC. What about through Spencer East Brookfield? Well, there will be three plan options, if approved, that will be offered. The, and this is for all the non-Medicare enrollees or retirees. All are offered by Fallon. Notice we have the Fallon Select Care HMO. Fallon's largest statewide network. It is the most expansive network that Fallon has. There are over 33,000 doctors in this network. We also will have the Fallon Direct Care HMO, just like what was in the GIC in terms of doctors and so forth. There are over 20,000 doctors in this network. And I'll say this, as many people uh, retired and chose the Fallon Select Care, we'll see that most people are in the Fallon Select Care, um, when a person retired, understandably a lot of people chose the Select Care Network because the direct care network at that time, years ago, really wasn't an expansive network. Today, the network has grown tremendously. There are now over 20,000 doctors there. So it's roughly two thirds the size of the overall network. My point in saying that is that more options will become available to you because of the sheer network growth of the direct care HMO. Then we have a Fallon PPO program. So to keep our promise of making sure that there's a plan available to everybody, that we want to make sure that if you live outside of Massachusetts, you can't belong to the, PP, to the HMO, we will have a Fallon PPO made available to you. And that is a national network of doctors and hospitals. This slide here talks to where, where uh, we just walked through the healthcare options. This uh, slide here speaks to other programs that are currently offered through the GIC to the retired teachers. That being life insurance. Currently a retired teacher will be able to receive a $15,000 life insurance benefit. Here too you see that a life insurance benefit will be made available in the same $15,000 benefit level. Same benefit. Dental insurance. Currently the GIC offers to retiree teachers an opportunity to enroll in a dental benefit if he or she wants that plan. It's a voluntary plan. The uh, retiree pays the full cost. It's a great plan. Here too, we see that the de that Blue Cross and Blue Shield will offer a Dental Blue PPO program available to you. And this program is fantastic. So another great program, another dental plan. So you can see from the comments earlier from the chairman, we are trying to provide you uh, coverage for medical insurance with multiple options, whether you live in Massachusetts, outside of Massachusetts, whether you're a Medicare enrollee or not a Medicare eligible enrollee, or whether you have life insurance or dental insurance, everything will be made available. So the big question everybody is wondering, what specifically is this gonna cost? So here is an exhibit that has been put together to show you by product, and I'll walk through this so everybody is comfortable with this exhibit. This will compare what are the costs Currently in the GIC, by the way, these represent costs effective July 1st. Just only a couple of weeks ago, the GIC released its new premiums. To no surprise, there have been increases in the premiums. So the GIC has released these numbers. These would reflect your numbers. They are, of course, rounded to the whole dollar. But we'll also show you the costs for the comparable plans that we just walked through. And we'll talk specifically, this will show the medical insurance and certainly the life insurance, the voluntary insurance uh, is on the dental portion. Uh, 
but nevertheless, as we look at this, it's important to note these figures that are shown here show a retiree contribution of 25%, the same contribution that the rest of the district uh, has towards uh, the insurance. So with that, as we look here, on the left-hand side, first at the top, notice in the left-hand corner, it says insurance plan type. Right below that are the Medicare plans. So these are the costs. This top section of the exhibit represents the costs and the plans for those people who are currently enrolled in Medicare A and B and through a Medicare program with the GIC. So we see that we had a Unicare indemnity, uh, the indemnity plan. Currently we have three people who are very early retirees. They are currently at $32 on a monthly basis for that Unicare plan. Moving to the right, looking at the MedEx plan, Blue Cross's indemnity plan, it's flexible freedom of choice plan, the plan you can choose if you live in Massachusetts or outside of Massachusetts. A lot of people refer to this as the Cadillac of the, the retirement plans. When you look at this plan, you can see that it would cost $67 on a monthly basis. So yes, when we look at the overall change in the numbers, the percentage looks large, understandable. However, when you look at it on an annual basis, with all due respect and looking at the numbers, it's a $420 annual number. Below that, we see that there are 85 people, 85 individuals who are in the indemnity plan today that are, that are retiree, who are retirees that will be paying $49 a month beginning July 1 with the GIC. That cost for the MedEx plan, because we want to compare it to the richest plan, the MedEx plan, again, would be $67 on a monthly basis or an annual difference of $216. Then we have 11 people covered by that Tufts Medicare preferred plan. Again, using the richest plan design, if they chose to join the MedEx plan with Blue Cross and Blue Shield, again, $67 for an annual cost or increase of $324. And then we have nine individuals who are on the Fallon Senior Plan, that plan where I mentioned there was doctor disruption and so forth. Well. We also have the HMO uh, Blue for Seniors program. And if they, these Fallon senior members wanted to go into the HMO Blue plan, the statewide HMO, it's $65. But notice how close the flexibility is in terms of the MedEx plan, the Freedom of Choice plan. It's a $2 difference. But still, you'll have the option of the HMO plan. That difference there, $264 over an annual basis if you go into the like plan. Below this, that's the Medicare portion, the top portion of the exhibit. The bottom portion of the exhibit are for those people who are non-Medicare eligible uh, enrollees in the GIC. On the left-hand side, we see that we have the Fallon Select HMO. We have 16 families, the F in the second column is for families. We have 16 families in that program where the retiree is paying $221 on a monthly basis. Through the GI, excuse me, through Spencer East Brookfield, that cost at the 25% level is $394 for an annual difference of $2,000. Then we have one individual who has retired a while back who is paying only $61 that person, uh, excuse me, that individual will go from 61 to $151 or a difference of 1,080 or a monthly difference of about $49, $50. Then we have 19 individuals who are more recent retirees paying 15% and they are uh, currently paying $92. That would go up to $151. Uh, and for an annual difference of 
Below that, we have the Fallon Direct HMO, and we only have four people in this network. To my earlier comment, many people chose the Fallon Select plan years ago because the Direct HMO network was not that large. It has grown tremendously. Again, over 20,000 doctors in that network alone. My point in saying that is that if you look at the Fallon Direct HMO, families are, one, are $173 beginning July 1 through the GIC. That will go to $333 or a difference of $1,920. The Fallon Direct with the one person who has retired, uh, with the one individual there is paying $72. That will go to $128, difference of $56 a month, uh, or $672 over the course of the year. If you are on the Select Care HMO, looking back up a, a category, you're one of those family members uh, of the 16. You can see that your costs will be, through Spencer East Brookfield, approximately $394. However, if in the process, the education process, you are able to look and see your doctors or hospitals are now part of the direct care network, then you can go from that 394 down to the 333. There, so there is an opportunity to reduce that increase, if you will. And remember, too, that many of the people who are in the non-Medicare category, if you will, these are generally early retirees. The vast majority are early retirees. Uh, however, many are in their, uh, you know, in the 63, 64 range. So what we're talking about here is not a change that will necessarily affect you going forward forever, if you will, because once you become Medicare eligible, if you become Medicare eligible at age 65, you're going from this column to the right of, let's say you're an individual at 151, you drop down to the column up above under the Medex plan, perhaps at $67. So it may be a short time frame, but again, we wanted to be, uh, we wanted to show the numbers, kind of in an apples to apples comparison, going from Fallon Select HMO through the GIC, Fallon Select through Spencer East Brookfield. Okay. And then we have the, Uni the Unicare Indemnity product, a freedom of choice plan. That program there, and again, of the uh, 23 people in the program, the vast majority, almost all, are Massachusetts residents. So you will have the opportunity to select the Fallon HMO, one of the Fallon HMOs. So you can see that that would, if you were to do that, that would certainly provide savings. Um, if you are a, an early retiree and you decide to leave Massachusetts and you know, go elsewhere, we'll also make available a Fallon PPO plan. So that flexible national network. Then as we look down below on that very last line, we see the life insurance plan. Currently, it's a $7 a month uh, cost for you, uh, for the retired teachers. That will change to $2. Same benefit of $15,000, but it is a $2 cost. So there is $5 in savings there on a monthly basis. That's the end of the presentation on the plans of the GIC versus the plans on Spencer East Brookfield uh, with that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kevin, uh, for that presentation. I I'm sure that that has generated a host of questions. And due to the number of people that are here, uh, rather than having to get up and come to the, the mic to ask your question, if you want to raise your hand, I'll recognize you. And I'll repeat the question for you from here so everybody will be able to hear. And uh, we'll direct the answer to the proper person that has the uh, 
the knowledge to answer that. And uh, when he finishes, I'll go back to you. So if you have a follow-up uh, question based upon the answer they give you, and we'll take the time and go through this process until we answer uh, everybody's questions. So is there anyone that, um, uh, yes, ma'am, would you give me your name, please? Yes, Christine Miller. Hi, Christy. Uh, I have several Kevin, uh, could you the Unicare programs, by the way, much of that exhibit was provided to us by the GIC. The Unicare program is a, is a unique program that the GIC offers where they can actually subsidize premiums for certain individuals. Uh, so th those numbers were provided by the GIC directly. Uh, either Kevin or Kim, uh, can either one of you address that? Uh, you are correct that there is a fund set aside uh, for retirees if, in fact, and, and it only applies to the Unicare product, in fact. Exactly, but what I'm asking is what happens to in the system? Uh, in our example, our costs do not reflect that, so there would be no subsidy, if you will, right. because you'd be outside. Uh, Dr. Melby, can you address that? To my knowledge, we don't receive anything, and I could uh, defer it to uh, Sue Torrey. Uh, we don't receive any um, benefit from it in terms of receipts, and on an annual basis, all school districts, uh, as well as municipalities, receive um, a statement, if you will, um, affectionately referred to as cherry sheet. Okay. And from that, uh, it lists uh, uh, any and all revenue at the time that the state would give out to a district, and we do not have that as uh, any revenue that we receive. Well, as a matter of fact, I know the answer to the question because I called GIC yesterday and I spoke to some of the school districts today that wanted the GIC. Uh, Kevin, can you address that? Uh, to, uh, to, to take a step back here, 
um, to reiterate what Dr. Malvi had just said. You're right, the credit, the stabilization fund is for, is established by the GIC. The GIC, the state, establishes the rate, and then from the money that is paid to the GIC, it's the GIC's discretion as to how much to credit back. The credit is given towards your monthly premiums. It is not a credit given back to the district. The district does not receive, correct, yes. As far as the negotiation goes, uh, I, I can't say that the state, uh, to say that the state specifically has the best bargaining power, I would not say that. In fact, I, I, I would say that that's probably. Excuse me, ma'am. Uh, we're going to ask a question, and then we're going to give an answer, and please don't interrupt them. When he's done, I'll go back to you, okay? Um, yeah. the, the, the state is certainly a powerful organization when it comes to, uh, when it comes to establishing rates and so forth. Uh, as uh, consultants, as, as advisors, we have very good bargaining power as well. So to say that the state has great bargaining power, really it's from the insurance company's perspective. See, the state has a number of carriers, a lot of different insurance companies it must satisfy. We here have been able to show you options with Fallon, with Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Fallon and Blue Cross and Blue Shield would love you to become members of theirs, and I know that they will treat you extremely well. Fallon currently treats a lot of the retirees well. They want to continue working with you, so they will offer a competitive proposal to earn your business, to keep your business outside of the GIC, if that were to be the answer. So to, I, I understand your point, uh, the GIC on by sheer numbers would seem like it is a very powerful bargaining group. It is, but it's not necessarily based on sheer uh, number, of, number of covered lives. Uh, collectively in our firm, we have far more members than, than what the GIC uh, has under its control. Unicare, uh, n not in the private market. No, I'm not sure <coughs> you spoke to, and I apologize. Okay, I apologize for that answer. Could be, I don't know, there are many companies. There's Unum out there. That's a, that's a like sounding company. It's one of our clients, it's certainly one of our carriers. So, as far as Unicare, Unicare really doesn't work in the private market, it really works in the GIC, the government market. Right, thank you, uh, Kevin. Um, if you have any other questions, I'll come back to you, Chris. Let's, we'll give some of this. Well, all right, all right, go, if that's your last question, go, go ahead and, and ask him. Right, I'll uh, answer, sure, sure. I'll answer the first part and then defer to my colleague, Julie, uh, that actually crunches the numbers for us. But the way we prepared the budget was based on um, what our existing plans are. And uh, this time of the year, we anticipate uh, what increases may be. And we build that into the budget, and then as time goes on and we get better information from the carriers, and certainly in the case of GIC, uh, we're able to adjust that figure. But it's, it's ongoing uh, pretty much up through the summertime. But the exact numbers I'll have to defer to our business manager, Julie, and she can nail that down. Mm -hmm. The number in the, that budget. Let, let me have Julie answer that second part. Yeah. Sorry, Julie. <laughs> the number in the budget is actually the assessment that GIC <clears throat> will assess us if we stay in. They set their actual assessments in January, and then they true it up over time. But in January, you get what your assessment will be. So that is, if we stay with the GIC, that's exactly what we'll have to pay for the GIC. All right. Thank you, Julie. Uh, anyone else with a question? Yes, ma'am. What's your name, please? Mary Ann Alasol, Price, Merrick, the Charles, he's retired. 
Yes, sir. Jack LaCroix, I'm a former teacher. I've been out of the loop for a while. Can, can you tell me why <laughs> Axel is here doing this presentation now? And did GIC, did a GIC representative get invited to come here tonight? And why weren't we given those cost sheets that were up there prior to this meeting? Mm -hmm. Those are things that we should have seen. How can we make a logical decision on this thing without at least having a chance to read down through those things and apply it to ourselves individually? And why are we talking about 25%? Where did that number come from? Thank you. Uh, Kevin? Uh, so a couple of questions there. Uh, first, why, why am I here? Uh, we are the advisors to the district. We are the experts, if you will, uh, in the insurance industry. We represent uh, virtually all the insurance companies, uh, not just here in Massachusetts, but throughout the country. Uh, so we know the market extremely well. We do the negotiation with the different carriers. We are able to uh, leverage our expertise in the market for the benefit of those who, who want to work with us. Where the 25% number came from, uh, that is a number that is the current contribution of the district teachers. So that was shown at the same level. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the, no. GIC? Uh, the GIC was a GIC representative uh, invited here this evening. Not to my knowledge, no. This is a process outside of the GIC. Anyone else? You didn't ask the figures. Why didn't you get the figures earlier? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the figures at the 25% level, we just really wanted to make sure we had them here in the exhibit. We can understand that if we shared them with everybody, uh, there really wouldn't be any focus uh, you know, on the presentation. Uh, quite right away, what would happen is people would just come to we, we agree that it's the most important part. In fact, when it came up, you heard me say, now, what is the big question for everybody? How much is this going to cost me? And as I was standing up here, I saw a whole lot of writing. So to those people, uh, you know, looking at the lines, and I'm a member on the Fallon Select Peer Plan, I'm right there. Uh, I think everybody knows the type of plan they had, so when they looked at the exhibit, you probably were able to zero very quickly in on what it meant to you, the impact. Okay. Um, yes, sir. Name, please. Uh, uh, excuse me. The superintendent has just uh, informed me that uh, uh, we can, we will be making that stuff available uh, to you. So, uh, go ahead. Uh, name, please. Lee Goodspeed. So I have a little more perspective. 
perspectives on the longer picture. And I'm going to comment first about what I feel is the status of retired teachers only. My disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. Everyone needs to seek their own advice. My thought is this. We entirely have a contract which the town, school committee, district is proposing to breach. The world of business survives because of contract law. And I expect any judge to uphold any proof of valid contract, meaning restitution, compensation, damages, etc. If you breach that contract by any of the I think the lawsuit is inevitable. As it stands now, each retiree holds a contract and each possesses their own voice. That means we each hire a lawyer and bring a suit. I propose to all retirees to form a tax against nonprofit corporation, which then possesses a fiduciary relationship to all, to hire a lawyer to represent the voice of all its members, aka all retirees who join the pay to seek such action. Three. Although I can conceive of numerous reasons why it would be unwise to reinvent the wheel by dropping GIC services and offering to presently employed teachers, that may be done as they have not yet accepted such an offer. <coughs> if you understand contract law, you will understand that an offer made by a competent entity and accepted by a competent legal entity, with consideration being part of the process, establishes a contract without writing, without signature. When I retired, I went and investigated what my retirement was going to be. And I was told it would be this, this, and this. And that was GIC. And the GIC has done very well. Now, just because they've given you a bunch of figures and a status at the moment, the GIC, when I started out, that $15,000 policy for life insurance to get you buried, let me tell you, when I started in 91, it was less than half of $15,000. You have to think in terms of what the GIC has done for the retired community. It has brought us along. There's no guarantee with this from what I'm hearing. <coughs> Static figures mean nothing. You have to think in terms of how many years out. And if Inflation, which occurred during the 70s, raises its ugly head again to any extent. You'll see some disasters. And by the way, Mr. Tim, I, I, I'm not being derogatory here, but you said that Spence is facing uh, an emergency or uh, catastrophe. Um, the definitions I heard for emergency and catastrophe is the town of which I've been a town uh, representative. Uh, is bankruptcy. I think what you're talking about is it's an emergency if you have to face two and a half over. That's not an emergency. Nobody just voted for the last year's con for the contract 13, 14, a 4.9. It's a 5% increase. And you're trying to hold it two and a half from what I understand. Well, that's <laughs> neither here nor there until you bring it to the top and say, I mean, you know, back in the 60s, there were some very progressive people in Spectre who decided to build a new high school called David Crowley Regional. Excuse me, because we're not going to go any further in this discussion, okay? This is for questions. I've let you go long enough. We're going to move on. Is there anyone else with a question, please? Mr. Quinlan. Uh, Tom Quinlan, I taught in the high school. Uh, I was a principal in the high school. I was a principal in the high
father now. She had a poopy up this And you know what that is, it's it is. But there's a medication that can cause a slower progression of the disease. And she had a fight even with human chair, but human chair came across and paid for the prescription. She had the prescription now, and it's it's wonderful that she be my life. I stay with this plan forever. Kevin, you want to go to Excuse us one second, please. Can't have anybody standing. Uh, you got to come down and fill some seats. The seats down front. The seats here. I'm sorry, okay, now I'm going to ask if you're not a retiree and we run short of seats and you're here for the school committee meeting, if you give us the courtesy of, of uh, moving out and getting the seats so that we can uh, give the retirees an opportunity to be seated and be here for this hearing. Apologize for the inconvenience, but somebody made a call to the uh, fire department of course they do. said that they're over capacity, so Given. thank you whoever that individual was. And uh, we're going to move people to the empty seats and we'll move people out. You gotta find a seat. You gotta come down and find a seat. There's plenty of them down front. Would, would, uh, would one of the ladies please go up in the back and see if there are any retirees out there that want to be part of this here and that don't have a seat and let them know that we've got seats. Well, we'll wait for that, Mr. Quinnivan. I'm sorry for the interruption. If you continue. So, for the medication, she goes into another plan, and she had a bunch of medication at this plan. Is she going to have to start all over again to buy another plan? And if they don't agree to it, she couldn't have it before. Okay. Kevin, could you address that, please? Uh, thank you, first of all, for sharing the story. It's, it's great that the woman was able to receive her, her prescription. I cannot speak to the medical policy of uh, the Unicare plan. Uh, many insurance companies face those situations, and we encounter it on a daily basis, uh, where a person is receiving medication, and if a new insurance company is, is presented, if that medication is not part of that insurance program's covered list, if you will, then that is a possibility, but there are always opportunities for appeal, and that's exactly the process that this woman went through. What the end result will be, I don't know, but you can understand how Blue Cross and Blue Shield is the largest insurance provider in our country. Uh, but they have certain medical policies as well. Uh, so that affects a number of people. That's why the appeals process is put in place so that they can hear stories like this, doctors get involved and so forth. So it is a uh, program that Blue Cross and Blue Shield has in place. Uh, if this prescription is covered, wonderful. If it is not, then the appeals process will go through and they will rely, I know Blue Cross does this because we deal with this, I know Blue Cross will listen to the providers and, and asking them, well, has this person been prescribed this medication in the past? Can the person receive other prescriptions that can treat the same condition? If not, Blue Cross has policies where they provide a lifetime exception. Again, I can't speak to the fact that uh, what the outcome will be, 
but I know that the same process will be in place that many insurance companies have, that appeals process and so forth. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Name, please. Sam Goodwin. Oh, hi, Sam. Hi, Mr. That is correct. The GIC right now, as we mentioned, controls really everything. The carriers that are available to you, the plan options that are available to you, the price that the district... Excuse me a second, Kevin. Please uh, keep the conversation down and go up to the level. It's just too important for the people that are asking the questions that would like to get the answers. Thank you. Okay. So the GIC does maintain full control in the scenario that we have today with the GIC. Coming out of that, it, it, to Spencer East Brookfield uh, program, if you will, uh, it, it does provide the district more leverage, more power, if you will, uh, down the line to address cost issues and so forth. Uh, but when we see that the current teachers are looking at the, 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 the current numbers are at 25%, for example, uh, that's something we, we, in our exhibit, we just use as the benchmark at 25%. So to answer your question, yes, uh, coming out of the GIC does provide the district uh, more control over the, the pricing of products, the plan designs, and so forth. Charlie, Mr. Buckley. I was a little sad that that wasn't brought up in the first place. Because <coughs> what the community is all about, and what the change to 25%. Uh, you heard, heard that uh, we wanted to make sure, clarify clarify some of the comments, rumors that were out there, if you will, that plans are being taken away or that they were going to be changed dramatically. We wouldn't have access to certain programs. That's not the case. I can tell you when working with the district, it is, it was, or still is, one of the chief concerns to make sure products are available. Cost is something that every entity, private, public, nonprofit, whatever it might be, it's always a, an equation. It's always part of the equation. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, yeah. yes, uh, yes, sir. Uh, David Lumen. Um, uh, David who? Lumen, representing my wife Beverly, who is a small field, retired teacher. Um, Mr. O'Keefe makes a strong point of how controlling the GIC is. It controls costs, it controls plans. But then he kind of pushes it off a little bit and says, well, the district, you know, gets more flexibility. Well, the problem, of course, is that the GIC, while it controls things, the district also controls it. And not to be disparaging, given the current situation, I would be a whole lot more comfortable with the GIC's controlling things. <laughs> yes, sir. Paul Brady, my wife, is a retired teacher. You've got to understand the report. If I could, just for one second, I, I, I'm going to allow you to speak, um, but the rules that we've been given from council for this hearing is that only the people with the actual retiree is allowed to speak. But I've given the flexibility to let other folks do it, and I'll continue to do it. Just try to keep it uh, open. Go ahead. Well, the reluctance is that, that we, I hear that, well, there are a lot of good doctors out there. I hear that, well, after tonight, the figures will be made available to us as far as what the costs are. And as far as the any medication, well, 
maybe that'll work out if you if you do the appeal right. So it's it, it's kind of it's very difficult to, to make a decision without uh, the information. Uh, the other the other question because Laura had to go to a, a finance committee meeting that she, she wanted to find out if you have an estimate of how much the savings for the town is. Kevin. Uh, so as far as let me address the first part of the question about uh, you know the information on the prescription and not show sure how a certain procedure or something will be covered. Uh, no insurance company, if you were to ask them, if you were to go to Fallon today and say, how much is it going to cost for my for my uh, doctor's office visit. No insurance company will provide you an answer up front. They always must wait until the claim is actually received uh, by the provider of service to, to assign benefits. Uh, however, you might be commenting on you want more detailed information on the plans themselves, uh, and, and that's certainly, if this moves forward, that will be provided to everybody. But for the sake of this evening's presentation and the time that we have, uh, we could have provided you line by line coverage of how much is an x-ray, how much is a doctor's visit, things like that. That is provided in plan information that will be absolutely shared with every individual who wants it. Uh, the, the second part of, of your question um, as to the savings to the district. At this time, we simply don't know. And the, reason, and, and the reason why is because there are a number of options available to you. Until we see final enrollment, we simply don't know what the bottom line savings or impact will be to the district. Okay, thank you, Kevin. We can get every page you have. Mrs. Magalitis. Yeah, I have a question. If you show the individual plan, what are the rates for the family plan for those of us who have spouses that are covered under the plan, you mm have -hmm. family plans at present, there were no family plans listed. Mm -hmm. There are no family plans on Medicare. Medicare is always an individual contract. The family plans were shown for those people who are under 65. Uh, who don't have access to Medicare or, or who were below the age of 65. And my, my second item is, you're asking us to vote on something without having all the information in one particular issue, uh, maximum out-of-pocket benefit for a year. I have no idea what that's going to be for Blue Cross or whatever. I looked online and found just as curiosity before I came here, GIC maximum out of pocket is $200 a year. Fallon maximum out of pocket for Medicare providers is $6,000 a year. So there is a big difference in benefit. And so you're asking us to vote on something. We don't know what the benefits are. I hear the word Cadillac, but I mean a simple thing such as is there a copay or no copay for doctors? Certainly you have that information. Cadillac, there are also many models of Cadillacs. The Cadillac is not one model. So until we have that information, I don't see how I can make an informed decision on whether I can go along with this or not, or I'm, or I'm in favor of it. Kevin. Sure. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the comment on the Cadillac. Maybe I'll uh, not use that example uh, going forward. Uh, but to your point about out-of-pocket maximums, out-of-pocket maximums are actually part of the federal legislation. So the recent law that has been passed on the national level speaks to out-of-pocket maximums. I'm not sure where the $200 number came from. I don't know that number. I'm not familiar with that number. It came from GIC and it, it could be on certain features of the plan, but there are overall out-of-pocket maximums. That's somewhat like an umbrella over all of the services. That's what you might have been looking at with Fallon. Uh, so to say <coughs> GIC is 200, Fallon is 2,000, uh, depends on the plans that are offered. Uh, th there are a lot of variables there. It's not the same maximum for every plan within GIC or outside of GIC. I don't understand that. However, you're asking us to vote approval on a plan, and we don't have any idea of what that is. 
So certainly we should have been given a, before we vote a range between this and between that, not $10.25. Okay, thank you, Benny. Uh, is there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes, you are correct because the vote by the retirees tonight is advisory only. Okay. So we're here in symbolism. Uh, 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 my second question it echoes a bit of what's been uh, asked here uh, earlier this evening. Um, I, I'd just like to understand for my own edification. You're asking retirees for, in essence, at least a symbolic approval to withdraw from the known entity called the GIC that they're all participating in and all have to take part of now without providing the detail for comparison's sake uh, for coverage, uh, for uh, coverage territories, for costs, in essence, before you take your vote. Your vote will be taken. Your vote must be taken if you're going to proceed based on your timeline. What I'm asking for is, can that information be provided for comparison if or can the vote to withdraw be delayed so that these retirees can understand what they're jumping off a cliff for and from? Because in essence, we're asking retirees tonight to leave the GIC, that parachute that they currently have for their health care, to jump off a cliff, leaving it behind, hoping that the next plan available on the way down the cliff is as good or better. Thank you. Um, either Kim or Kevin? Kevin? You're right, the, the time frame is tight with the April 1st effective date, or excuse me, notification date upon us. That is um, something that uh, is unique to the GIC to require for three months notice for a change when the rest of the market would receive a notice or accept the notice the day before. So the GIC does put us into a little bit of a bind go through this process, and it's a lengthy process, and this is part of that process. 
as far as the detailed plan information <coughs> upon the vote, upon the decision, you can be certain that we will do our best to get you the information, and that was outlined in, in the, the agenda portion. You can bet that you will receive the information right away to help you with the process. And, and know that it would not be a process where we simply mail you information and you are left trying to understand that information on your own. There would be a lot of hand-holding through the process where we will have Blue Cross, Fallon, and it's not over a period of one meeting or so, we will make sure that there are many sessions available to you to learn more, to sit down with the representative, to hear all your different options, to find out if your doctors are part of the Fallon Direct Network, from, for example, to save you or to reduce that cost exposure. So it will be a very involved process, a very informative process, and you'll have all the information to make the best decision for you and for your spouse. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, Mr. Goddard, I saw your hand up next year. Richard. Hi, I'm Richard Goddard. I've been retired for approximately 17 years. During that entire time, my prime concern is how much money as a retired person am I going to earn? That amount is dependent on the amount at which I retired minus my health insurance and life insurance costs. With GIC, I have known what those costs were. Therefore, I was pretty assured of what I was going to earn in any given year. What I've seen tonight, I have no idea what my insurance costs and what my uh, retirement, uh, my medical insurance and my life insurance costs are going to be. And that bothers me. And so that's, <laughs> that's why it's very difficult for us to make a decision when we have five days left. Whatever it is. Thank you, uh, Rich. Uh, we're we have, uh, we're going to continue with more questions for those people that haven't had an opportunity to ask one. I don't know that we'll get back to a second round because we have another meeting that was scheduled at 7 and we're now closing in on 7.30, but I would like to go continue and go back to the retirees that still have not had an opportunity to ask a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, that the gentleman from the consultant firm, the board did not spread down the process. He will take everybody through to decide what claim he or she wants, but what? But that is after the fact, after you have already voted your decision. So that breakdown of the process doesn't mean anything at this point to us because we have no say. But you, it's after your vote. And I think it's important that people realize it's after your vote. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else that has to ask David? I think if this was to happen again, your information. I mean, I'm totally confused right now. So that if, when that was sent out on February 18th, if a follow-up with some kind of information was sent to us, we wouldn't be sitting here confused about a major issue in our lives. Okay, thank you, Marie. Um, anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Jan Maria. I taught thank 40 you. years in Spencer East Brookfield. And I think what you're doing is unconscionable. We never knew. <laughs> when we retired, that all the diligence we had taken out of our paychecks every week would result in this. We all realized that the Spencer East Brookfield School District is in a shambles. That's not our fault. You are, you are picking on the most vulnerable population. We have no vote. Can you imagine being in America? Right now, we have no vote. How about that? I can flag the flag tonight, by the way, because of that. I'm so angry. Uh, but we are at our most vulnerable. It's like kicking a puppy. Amen. Thank you. I would like to know, 
Would you ever consider grandfathering in all retirees? And if, if that was ever, you know, if that ever came to your mind? And perhaps going forward, that you wouldn't offer GIC for those retirees? Uh, Kevin? Kim, if, if I'm overlapping on any of these, uh, feel free. We, we certainly did consider uh, a lot of different options. Grandfathering um, certainly part of it, but we had been advised by council that that was not possible uh, for the vast majority of folks. Why? 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 It's a little bit of a complicated issue. It is controlled by the statute that provides for um, health insurance to public employees. It's a Mass General Laws Chapter 32B. And um, I would respect any of you who could read it and understand it completely, to be perfectly honest with you. But within that statute, there's a provision that talks about grandfathering, and it's a very good question. Um, certain people could be grandfathered in at the rate that they are paying now. What I mean is the contribution rates, I think, if I understand this correct, some of you may be paying 10%, others are paying 15%, depending on the date of the uh, person's retirement. And the, the balance of the employee, the balance of the, um, the employees in the district are paying the 75-25. By law, by Chapter 32B, folks who are <laughs> covered by an indemnity plan and I can't remember the numbers, but we could ask Kevin for us, but those people cannot be grandfathered in, and that's the law. That's not me who wrote it, and it's not the school committee, that's the law, so there could be no grandfathering in for those persons who take an indemnity plan. Those who are not an indemnity plan, there is the possibility of a, a grandfathering provision. Um, we did talk to the school committee about that, and made a recommendation that to some degree, equalizing the rate that everybody paid seemed to be the fairest way to do it. And I recognize that I'm sure many of you here think none of this is fair. So why should we be, you know, required to pay that extra percentage? Um, but the rate differential, as as Kevin showed you on the rate sheet, was shrinking in terms of the added cost for those folks who were Medicare eligible and who were going into the indemnity plan. So the cost differential to them seemed to be the smallest, so it seemed to be a fair way to administer the changeover. Um, okay. yeah. um, we're getting close to having to probably take a few more questions because we still have a lot of time uh, for the vote to be taken and the recording of the vote, but I'll take a couple more. Yes, ma'am? Uh, I'm blinded here, but I don't know. Okay, retirement yeah. If we only have five days, The excuse me, procedure for tonight is obviously to have this public hearing and uh, then the committee uh, could uh, call for the vote. Uh, if they did, obviously you folks would weigh in on that. And then once the hearing is brought to a close, the committee then would open the special meeting of which this issue is one of the agenda items. The committee could act on it this evening based on the posting of the meeting and the agenda, or they could defer it to a later date, still looking at that April 1 deadline that's coming up. But with respect to whether the committee uh, can uh, postpone the vote this evening, it would be the call of the committee. That means with their permission, they could do that. The possibility exists, and I can't speak for uh, the feeling of the individual members if they would want to go forward or to postpone it. Procedurally, it could be done. Can someone else have their hand up? Uh, yes, probably got to be close to the last one. Uh, my name is Susan DuPont, a retiree in the very near future. And first of all, 
I know of a very successful company in Spencer that offers their employees a family plan and offers them a single plan and it offers them a person plus one, which would be husband and wife. And I have never heard in this area, they said, well, because the two people that are paying for insurance have to help out pay for someone who has four, five, or six people. Yeah. This is the comments that I've been hearing. Right. And I would ask that the committee look into setting up some sort of a tier where a, a spouse and their husband or wife can have that kind of tier for the insurance instead of having to pay for my husband and I, why should we pay for someone who has five or six kids? Okay? Kevin, uh, Kevin can you address that? Yeah. Uh, three tiered rates are what you're referring to. And, and yes, that's a possibility that companies look at. I can tell you that we look at that uh, quite a bit for our clients. Uh, and you're right, it would help out the person who has the employment scarf. But behind the scenes, the numbers, if you will, for the people who are families that have three or more, their rates would skyrocket. They would climb even more because the insurance companies is looking to gather so much money to cover the claims of those insured. However you break it up, they still have the same number of people, spouses, children, and so forth, to insure within a group. If we allow, if you know, the decision was to have a two-person rate, well, to the insurance company, they were charging a family rate before that's lost money, if you will, the whole equation of the money that they need to collect. That lost money is then piled on to all the families that remain in there. So it's a matter of what is fair, what's equitable. Uh, and yes, we can present those options, but I can tell you when we present them, few companies actually uh, go that route because of the severe impact it has on the remaining family plans. And one comment okay. to make is that uh, this governing body of our school committee, you are going to make a vote. And you are going to vote. Whatever you vote, you've got our future. You have our financial future that we have. They have worked for 30 or 40 years. We are working for 30 or 40 years to retire, to be able to retire and afford to retire. And you gave us a figure of 25%, and I, from everything I have heard, we are never going to see that 25%. Okay. And I, your, our future is in your hands. And that's a huge responsibility for a group that has not shown a lot of responsibility. Thank you. Uh, that be the and, uh, that's probably going to be the last question unless somebody's got something that's really. Oh, I'm sorry. I told you I would get back to you. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I know that one of my favorite school districts is Bellevue. And I'm sure
And it says, according to Mercer's National Survey of Employee Sponsored Health Plans, GIC rate increases are lost in the national employer trends, which are predicted to increase 2.1% in 2014 and an increase of another 5.2 in 2015. So without going on with that, you might be better if we could maintain what we have. And if we maintain what we have, you might find it beneficial not this year, but the next two years, if, they, if it's true what they say. Thank you. Okay, Jim, do you want to comment on that? Or? <laughs> I'm well aware of the 1% the notice that the GIC put out. Uh, that 1% increase, however, was an aggregate increase across all products that GIC offers. When we bring it home here to the individuals in this room, many, a couple of the products actually saw 4% increases. So the 1% was really just an aggregate number, an average for all products. In fact, the products represented here, for the vast majority, are represented a little bit more than a 4% increase. The GIC has, like the, the, the private market, the rest of the market, the GIC grapples with insurance costs every year. And almost every single year, you have seen increases to your premiums at different levels. We too experience that in the private market and we do whatever we can, everything and anything for our clients to make sure that impact is as low as possible. So we do exactly what the GIC does. The GIC has seen increases year after year. Certainly we deal with the same, um, the same um, issue. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. Why is it more cities and towns are joining, again, GIC, as opposed to any other plan. They are now uh, representing 413,000 people, and we just this past week, the news is Framingham, East Bridgewater, Middlebrook, are all going GIC. We're going out, and most people are coming in. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think the decision is one uh, individually for the district. Uh, their issues may not be the same as the concerns here. Um, I can say that there have been several districts coming out of the GIC. You are not the only one. There was a town just uh, that just voted on it as well. So there are, we are not the first. So it has been done, it has been done successfully. Uh, and you know what other districts do, I can't comment on that. I don't have any concerns. All right, thank you. Um, now we're gonna have the last question, uh, Mr. Latola. Hey, Bartholomew Retiree. I, I guess uh, from what you said about the co-pays, my, my concern is, uh, can you give us any assurances that the co-pays not going to escalate dramatically, that they're going to be relatively stable. Yes. Sure. Uh, when you talk about escalate dramatically, uh, I can tell you that the co payments that are in place with the Fallon plans, uh, the early retirees, those people not eligible for Medicare, they are almost better. And now, again, you can break it down line by line doctor's office visits, prescriptions, and things like that. But I can tell you the intent was to provide a very comprehensive plan design for those programs. The Medex plan is a very comprehensive program. You know, doctor's office visits, hospitalization, everything like that. So I feel confident in saying that no, they will not increase dramatically. Right, thank you, Kevin. Um, we've got uh, one last comment, 30 seconds. And Thank you. Uh, at this point, um, and, and I, I know that, um, I hope it's not the case, but I, I hope that uh, no one finds that they haven't had an opportunity to speak. I've tried to give everybody at least one shot at it, and some several. Um, but we have uh, 
other obligations uh, to deal with the, the, on the time constraints. Right. What's the pleasure of the board? Are there any, do you want to continue uh, more time or are there any motions or? Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman, pleasure this time. Mr. Mm -hmm. Cloutier. I make a motion that a vote be taken of the retired teachers in attendance to see if they're in favor of transferring out of the GIC to the school district's insurance plans effective July 1st of 2014. Why? I'll second that, Mr. Chairman. Okay, motion made by Mr. Cloutier and a second made by uh, Mr. Nordquist. Any discussion? If not, uh, Mary. First, I apologize for uh, you coming in late, but it's obvious that these retirees in attendance do have further questions. And for them to vote on something that they feel they did not get informa enough information on, I feel we are not doing our job to them. We need to provide them the information that they're looking for before they can take a vote. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> if there's no other comments, then we will take a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Nodquist? Aye. Uh, Mr. King? Aye. Mr. Cody? Aye. Ms. Gershman? No. Mr. Cudia? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So at this point, we'll ask the uh, counters to come forward. And what we would ask the retirees to, get, to do when the counters are ready, uh, you've been given cards as you come in. And um, we'll start with, um, when the girls tell me to get ready, we'll start with all those that are in support of leaving the GIC to raise your card. We'll take that. Uh, you're going to stand and raise your card if you're in favor of leaving the GIC. Yeah. If you're not able to get up for medical reasons, you can stay seated and raise your card and count you. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll do the ones that are in favor for us, and then we'll take a vote on, on those that are against. Mr. Chairman, in favor of what now? I, I just heard two different statements. In favor of leaving or in favor of staying in GIC? If you're in favor of leaving the GIC, please stand now and raise your card. That makes it very easy for a count. And now, if you're not in favor of leaving the GIC, please stand and raise your card. We have to have a count. Yes, uh, Linda. Yes. Was there an executive session that just happened that we weren't aware of? Uh, no. 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 And my other question is, I don't know why you're rushing this tonight. Is this too important? The, the, that, the hearing session is over, Mrs. LeBear. We've had the vote taken. I'm going to announce the vote uh, at this point. Uh, the vote was 92 uh, and uh, zero in favor. Okay, so the retirees have made it clear on their position. Is there any motions before the board at this point? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we refer this to our school committee meeting under discussion, which immediately follows this meeting. Is there a second? Second, Mr. Chairman. Any discussion in regards? If not, on a roll call vote, Mr. Nodquist? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Mr. Cody? Aye. Ms. Gershman? No. Mr. Cloutier? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Um, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we close the public hearing. Motion made to close the public hearing. Is there a second? Second, Mr. Chairman. Second by Mr. Nodquist. Discussion on a roll call vote. Mr. Nodquist? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Mr. Cody? Aye. Ms. Gershman? Aye. Mr. Cloutier? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Uh, at this point, uh, we'll take, uh, yeah, we'll take about a 10 minute recess and then we'll, we'll be coming back to the uh, school committee meeting. Uh, in respect to the uh, chief's requirements, um, uh, I'm going to move this uh, issue for discussion for the board up to the first uh, item on the agenda uh, so that uh, it won't uh, delay any longer folks having to wait. Uh, so uh, for the benefit of the board, we'll skip over the first items on the agenda and we'll go down to item number, number three, 
uh, review and discussion of approval of possible placement of teacher retirees from the GIC insurance into the district health plan. Uh, comments, discussion from board members? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cludia. <clears throat> I'm prepared to make a motion, but before I do that, I want to explain to the retirees face to face for what it's worth, how I came to my dis decision on this. And I want to make sure it's clear because although I know uh, Mr. O'Keefe did an excellent job making the presentation, I'm not sure that everybody picked up on it. There are approximately 70 retirees of this district in our district right now who are on district insurance plans and they're paying 25% of their retirement, of, of the uh, premium, excuse me. Where is the equity in having 70 employees that work for this district paying 25% and teachers who work for this district just as hard, just as, uh, did just as good a job paying 10 and 15%. Somebody said we're trying to balance the budget on the backs of the retirees. That's not the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. This is about equity across the district. If anybody's heard me speak since last May when I got on this board, that's what I've been trying to find and pound into everybody's head, is equity across the district. Not just on this issue, but on a whole host of issues. Change is difficult, I understand that. We asked our consultants, the consultants that have been with this district long before I came here, to bring forth plans to take the, the, the retirees out of the GIC that were comparable or better plans. They've told us they've done that. They've told us they've accomplished that. We've offered the top quality plans in the private sector that are available. And rather than have the discrimination between folks paying 10%, 15%, and 25%, I'm comfortable raising it to 25% contribution. That's my rationale, and it's just one person's opinion. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'm prepared to make a motion to transfer the retired teachers <laughs> from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Government Insurance Commission health insurance plans to the school district's health insurance plans effective July 1st of 2014. Is there a second to that motion? Uh, second, Mr. Chairman. Seconded by Mr. Nodquist. Uh, discussion? Any comments from members in regards uh, to the motion in the second? Uh, just to add to what Mr. Cloutier says, this is a is a very painful decision uh, for me as well. I see uh, so many folks here that I consider friends and, and, and people that I've known for years. Uh, but we are in a very, very difficult situation. And uh, we are charged of, with trying to provide the best education possible that we can for our kids. And we're getting our legs cut out from underneath us at every turn. And um, this has been stalled for a long time, and uh, unfortunately, I think we're at the point that I don't want to have to come back here if I'm still on this board two years from now and say to those people that I see here tonight that I've known for so long, we can't give you insurance coverage anymore. We, we don't have it. Uh, and we've been, we're being overseen by the state. We've got state overseers here. We're having a host of problems brought to our attention. I've only been here for eight months. I had no idea uh, what I was walking into. You have no idea what Mr. Cloutier and myself have walked into. And um, we do this with a heavy heart, uh, trust me. So if there's no other comments uh, from any of the members, we'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Nodquist? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Mr. Cody? No. Ms. Gershman? No. Mr. Cloutier? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Uh, we will keep uh, the superintendent's office, will keep all retirees up to date. Uh, the insurance brokers will be putting together information. We'll be following that to all the retirees, and we'll be bringing a complete staff of professionals in that will aid us uh, through the process um, of, of doing all the paperwork and, and doing what we have to do. And in light of that, I, I thank you all for coming. Uh, the next uh, the next item on the agenda is Knox Trail trip request. 
Are the uh, bodies responsible for that, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman? Uh, there is uh, Mr. one. Claudia. There's there's uh, another procedural motion that we're going to need uh, to take uh, with respect to that, and that motion is to authorize the chairman of the school committee and the superintendent of schools to take such action as may be necessary to carry out the school committee's vote to transfer the retired teachers from the GIC to the school district's health plan, effective July 1, 2014. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second that, Mr. Chairman. Seconded by Mr. Nardquist. Any discussion on that motion? If not, on a roll call vote, Mr. Nardquist? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Mr. Cody? No. Ms. Gershman? No. Mr. Cudia? Aye. The chair votes aye. The next item on the agenda is the Knox Trail trip request. Are those folks here? Mr. Chairman, is uh, either Joyce or Jody uh, with us? Is, oh, I'm sorry, Jody. Uh, Jody Barrasso, Assistant Principal for Knox Trail, will uh, present the field trip request for the annual trip to New York. Jody, thank you. For both the New York and the peer leader um, on a National Honor Society trip. The grade eight New York trip is scheduled for Wednesday, June 11th. Um, it's an annual trip for all eighth graders who would, would like to attend. Um, and then the peer leader trip is for um, June 16th or 6th for, at High Meadows in Granbury, Connecticut. All, all students that want to attend can go. We don't hold anyone back due to financial hardship. Um, and I guess it's been going yearly, so we just need your approval. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Yep. Well, I don't have a question. I just have to disclose that um, my child is in part of the peer leader group, so I would like to disclose that before a vote is taken. Any other questions? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, so voted. Did we, Mr. Chair? Did we take a motion to approve the trip? Mr. Chairman, motion to approve. Motion made, seconded. Second. Seconded, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Both so voted. Next item on the agenda, uh, report of possible closing of Lake Street School, Dr. Melby. Uh, at a previous school committee meeting um, relative to uh, budget development and eventual uh, budget approval, the school committee took action and asked the superintendent and the uh, administration to look at the possibility of uh, closing Lake Street Elementary School. Uh, part of the issue relative to that uh, obviously is what uh, potential cost savings the district might be able to recover from that. And then uh, most importantly is what would be the educational impact uh, of it. Uh, as everyone knows, uh, this school year that we're currently in, when I arrived in July, the committee had already taken action to close Maple Street Elementary School. Uh, there was no real concrete plan to uh, put that into effect, but through the good work of uh, my colleagues at the administrative level, uh, the custodial staff, uh, the assistance of uh, the DPW Department of the Town of Spencer, and others uh, through the uh, Sheriff's uh, Office, uh, their uh, release program, we did pull it together and we were able to get everything uh, moved where it needed to be, although, as you recall, we were a bit crowded, uh, particularly at Lake Street School opening day. Um, I, uh, I can remember the, um, the look on um, Principal Zablocki's face the opening day when we still had a good number of our furniture, desks, et cetera, in there, but we made it work, and um, pleased to say that eventually everything found a final resting place and we were able to continue on in the school year. Uh, but any type of consideration of closing of a school comes with uh, obviously great angst because you're potentially putting an educational facility, um, taking it out of uh, operation, uh, and there's a lot of emotion with that. But we are in um, hard times, difficult times, uh, not only in this uh, school district, but uh, across the Commonwealth trying to make <coughs> ends meet. It's no surprise that uh, we inherited uh, collectively a financial situation beyond anyone's imagination, but I'm also pleased to say that we've been able to turn that around. We have put the train back on the track. 
Uh, we've been able to balance our books and account for all our funds. Uh, not that we have money pouring out of the sky for us, but we've been able to put our financial house in order. The second uh, component of that uh, uh, putting our place in a house in order was relative to our curriculum plans. There really hadn't been done, uh, too much work done over the years, but through the assistance of the State Department of Education, we're making inroads on that, and we have things in place that will continue for a good number of years going down the road. But the central point is, can you close another elementary school? So I've provided the school committee with information, and on the first um, piece of that, there is a potential savings of uh, 400 plus thousand dollars um, by closing out an elementary school and that's obviously because of moving children out of that school into other potential places throughout the district uh, changing um, the uh, the need for a variety of supplies and heating and electricity etc cetera, etc cetera. organizational standpoint from uh, what we need for administration and support personnel if we're able to absorb um, that operation, if you will, in the existing facility. So from a potential of um, 400 plus thousand dollars of savings, uh, there also is the realistic part of looking at the space that we have throughout the district. And uh, I'm uh, just simply providing an overview of that to the school committee this evening. So if anyone's keeping score, I'll give you what the current arrangement is at uh, the three major schools that would be um, affected by this. And that's Lake Street School itself has 15 classrooms um, that would have to be moved. And of those 15, it also includes free, uh, four of our preschool uh, classes. So a total of 15, but four of the classes are identified for our preschool program. East Brookfield currently has 11 classes that they need for their operation on a K through six facility. And Wire Village has uh, currently 18 classes that are either being used or some may become available. But uh, Wire Village is arranged on a grade two through five uh, arrangement. Uh, for those that are keeping track, the um, junior high school, Knox Trail, uh, has a uh, grade uh, six, seven, eight arrangement because of the closing of Maple Street School, and the high school remains nine to 12. So taking those three schools of Lake Street at 15, East Brookfield at 11, Wire Village at 18, the available rooms that we're projecting for next year would be East Brookfield would have two classrooms available, Wire Village would have eight classrooms available, and Knox Trail would have five classrooms available. What we would hope to do on face value, and this doesn't mean that it's a final product, but on face value, if from Lake Street, from the 15 classes, including the four preschool, if we pulled the four preschool out and put them into Knox Trail that has five available, we still would have one available classroom. The combined available classes between East Brookfield and Wire Village at 10, two at East Brookfield, eight at Wire Village. The uh, number that we would need um, coming out of Lake Street would be 11 classes, so we'd be one shy, one shy. That's at face value. So I'm not in a position this evening to recommend that we can do that because we still have some homework, I believe, that we would have to do to see if there's any way that we can reconfigure. Over and above the basic classroom arrangement, and the given, given the, the differences uh, in grades that we have, with the addition that we have specialized programs in some of the facilities, we have Head Start programs, we have a collaborative program that takes up space, and we also have a number of support areas between uh, OT, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech, et cetera. We also have some uh, additional requirements given the age level of the students, particularly at Lake Street School because they are so young. So where I'm at this evening is not to close the door on the conversation, 
but I'm not here to recommend that it can be done given what information I have this evening. The possibility exists, but there's still some more homework that would have to be done. So based on that, I'm recommending to the school committee the following. And I'll read from my prepared statement. Although from a financial perspective, the closing of Lake Street School could result in cost savings, <clears throat> I am not prepared to recommend such a change at this time. I would offer the following actions to be taken and recommend going forward if the school committee wishes to pursue this matter. Number one, <clears throat> authorize the administration to review the possibility of various grade reorganizations to accommodate the closing of Lake Street School and the redistribution of elementary students. And what that means is that if you followed what I just said relative to the number of classes that we currently have in those facilities, what we would need going forward, on face value it doesn't work. But if the committee wishes administration to continue, we can come up with other options to see if it would work by reconfiguring our space and redistributing students. The second recommendation I have is to request the administration to attempt to minimize the impact of any changes on the East Brookfield elementary students with respect to being assigned to other district schools. If anyone has been following the conversation for uh, the recent past, but certainly it came up uh, around about this time last year, there was some concern of whether students from East Brookfield could be redistributed. The eventual decision by the school committee was not to do that, but they did make some decisions with respect to moving sixth grade students out of Wire Village up to Knox Trail, and then a different grade configuration at Lake Street because of the closing of Maple Street, and then similarly a, grade, a different grade configuration here at Wire Village because of the movement of those other children. So the third recommendation that I'm making to the school committee is to consider utilizing space at David Prouty High School as to possible elementary programs being reassigned to the high school. What that simply means is that to take a look at all available space, and I've said it a number of times to my uh, school committee and the public that necessity is the mother of invention, and when you're in hard times you have to come up with some creative solutions, ergo the high school becomes an option potentially for creating programs to move elementary school students up there. Case in point, in my career I've been involved in many, many school districts where we have had either preschool or early childhood programs and kindergarten programs at the high school level with dedicated space. Probably if we were to sit down and to try to design our ideal school, we may let that go by the wayside. But again, necessity is the mother of invention. And when we're hard pressed, we might have to reopen that and look at it differently. But I can tell you from at least my experience, properly planned, it can work. The fourth recommendation that I make to the school committee is that should they do go forward, that we hold a public hearing in the near future to allow for the public input. Part of my experience having done a number of reorganizations in districts, we always have gone forward to the public to allow that input, that discourse, yes, the concerns, the complaints, all the options are put out on the table, and then ultimately bring a recommendation forward to the school committee for potential action. And last but not least is number five recommendation to consult with town officials for municipal input and impact. Throughout the course of my uh, nine months now here in the district, I believe that there has been uh, an open uh, at least um, uh, solicitation of uh, input from the municipal officials on some of the key issues. And uh, this is certainly a uh, key issue that would have potential impact both for Spencer and for East Brookfield. If anyone has been following the discussion, you know that there's a good deal of concern on the part of the East, East Brookfield municipal officials as well as parents 
staff, and certainly Mr. Tomlin, who has spoken very um, eloquently of maintaining the integrity of that elementary school. So I'm recommending that if we are going to go forward, then we probably should open up the conversation. So I bring that to the attention of the uh, school committee for their consideration. I believe the savings are tremendous. And given the difficult uh, financial times that we're involved uh, in, it certainly would help to uh, lessen the impact on both communities as we go forward with the proposed FY15 budget. But we're not there yet based on the potential reconfigurations, and I'm looking for some additional time. So, Thank you, Dr. Um, comments or questions from board members? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Claudia. I brought this uh, request forward, and so I appreciate uh, Dr. Malvey getting back to us. We asked him to get back to us this evening. Dr. Malvey, uh, through, through the chair to you, uh, at our next meeting, do you feel that you could have a, a better handle on, on space for us, if it was even feasible to do this? I believe so, uh, as long as we're not meeting Wednesday night or Thursday night of this week. Mr. <laughs> Chairman, Mr. Chairman, what's our next meeting? I believe uh, April 8th. April 8th. April, April 8th. Does that give you sufficient time, Dr. I, uh, I, I'll do my best, yes. Okay. Yep. Gives me a little bit of breathing space. Um, I agree with all your recommendations, and I think it's... Uh, they're good recommendations. I certainly uh, would like to move forward on all fronts, including item four, scheduling and holding a, a uh, public hearing for public input. Uh, nobody likes change in this district. It's, it's been proven time and time again. A plan change can be good change, and I certainly want to make sure that we're not taking and putting a square peg in a round hole. I want to make sure that if we're going to make this change, that we have sufficient space, not just for today, but for next year, and uh, moving forward. <clears throat> so with that, I, I'd make a motion that uh, at the chair's discretion, we you know, schedule and hold a public hearing uh, for input on this matter. And that certainly can be in conjunction with one of our meetings. OK, any other uh, comments or discussions? Uh, uh, we do have a, um, a district policy in regards to uh, the procedure to uh, close the school. Uh, Dr. Malby, can you? Uh, give us a brief overview? Well, there are, uh, and I don't have, I apologize, I don't have it with me this evening, but there are steps that the committee needs to uh, adhere to from a policy standpoint uh, on going forward on this type of uh, endeavor. But more importantly, I want to comment, if I may, Mr. Chairman, on the uh, uh, agreement. Yes. Okay. Uh, what I've asked permission for is on, uh, to make a commentary relative to the regional school agreement that originally convened the two towns, East Brookfield and uh, Spencer. Um, there are parts to that agreement that deal with this specifically if it requires an amendment um, to the agreement. And the amendment can be initiated by action of the school committee or it could be initiated by action of um, the member towns, if you will, eventually to come forward to the school committee. In some respects, uh, the, um, there's another provision with re regard to amending the agreement uh, and or the withdrawal of uh, any of the towns, that that uh, has a certain process to follow for the initiation of that activity if anyone were inclined to uh, look at that as a possibility. But I, I want to be upfront with everyone that if this does move forward, I as superintendent will be very attentive to apprising the committee and certainly will be consulting with uh, legal counsel as well that if they do cho choose to go that route that we make sure that we follow the dictates of the agreement. I've had some conversation with uh, municipal officials on both sides, if you will. They're aware of it, they're sensitive to it, and uh, as we go down the road, uh, 
if there is a, a real possibility of that, I think that will be foremost on the school committee's mind to make sure that they adhere to uh, what that regional school agreement is. So I want to put that out there so that people realize that we're aware of it, we'll be attentive to it. We're not trying to uh, put it to the side and at different occasions members of the school committee have raised the issue and I just want folks to know out there that we will uh, certainly look at that very, very closely. Thank you, Dr. Malvey. Uh, Mary, do you have a question? Well, that did touch on one of my questions. My other question is, Num uh, number three, your, your um, consideration of elementary school at the David Prouty High School. My concern is NEASC, with the building itself, well, that was one of their main concerns about the cr accreditation through NEASC was the condition of the building. If we're going to move kindergarten or preschool students to a building that is already a concern for high school students, do you think that we will be getting NIAC accreditation for our youngest of students? And if we do not get NIAC accreditations, are we there at the risk of losing grant money? Because it's my understanding we do have grant money because we are NIAC accredited. Is that a question or a statement? I guess it's a question. Are we Dr. Gonna... Malby? If I understand it, uh, Mary, is the first part about accreditation in general for the high school, given the condition of the school? Correct. That, yeah. that was one yeah. of the asks concern. Right, right. Um, I, I don't think, um, conceptually, I don't think that that would rule us out from taking a look-see to examine it. But to your point, we would have to be very careful because you just can't take elementary school students and put them in a facility that was designed for high school students, teenagers. But with uh, possible uh, modifications, if we're able to handle that, it could become doable. I don't think that, that necessarily would impact the high school standpoint because the programs would stand on their own two feet, if you will. So that's relative to the accreditation of the high school. And what Mrs. Gershman is referring to is the NEASC New England Association of Schools and Colleges accreditation that accredits high school secondary programs. So I think that's the way we would look at it and be very sensitive to it. The second part she mentioned is NIAC accredit accreditation, and NIAC accreditation is relative to uh, the early programs the, that we have uh, in our school district, and uh, many school districts many school districts do have that. We would have to make sure that the uh, T's are crossed and the I's dotted so that as we go forward for that accreditation the way we're currently configured that we'd be able to have a mirror image of that at the high school. If we couldn't do that, if we were to move those young children up there, if we couldn't do that, then yes, we run the risk of losing the accreditation and that would weigh heavily on me of the type of recommendation I would make at that time. But we will look at that very, very carefully. I have to rely on my, my fellow administrators to point me in the right direction with that because everything will be a, a check, check. If we have it now, check. Can we do it somewhere else on that mirror image? Check. And if we can't, then I'd be reluctant to bring that forward. Thank you, Dr. Malvey. Uh, Mary, do you have any other questions? That was it. Thank any you. Any questions for any other board members? Just a question, Not a comment. Um, just Mr. Chairman, was that a motion made by Mr. Cluglia? Yes, it was. Then I'll, I'll second that motion, so uh, I have that second. What is the motion? Uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go back in a second uh, and have Mr. Cluglia re restate the uh, okay. motion. Do you have any other questions? Oh, no, thank you. Do any other board members have any questions? Uh, Mr. Cloody, would you restate your motion, please? Certainly. It would be to hold a, convene a public hearing on this matter um, at one of our future uh, committee meetings. Okay, motion made by Mr. Cloody to convene a public hearing on this matter at a future school committee meeting. Seconded by Mr. Nodquist. Any further discussion on that? All those in favor, aye. Aye. And opposed? So voted. Uh, any other motions or Concerns, discussions in regards to this issue? No? Okay. Question. Oh, I'm sorry, Mom. Um, well, what's your. I, I would ask the committee of uh, whether you want to do it before the 8th, before you have really some detailed information, 
Um, just to broach the concept of would you rather wait, hear the information, and then have the public hearing of what proposal you may be leaning toward. It's, you know, which way you want to go, whatever the flavor of the committee is. If, if you still um, intended to go forward with it, you have time. Right. Prior to I, I, the town I, think, I think at this point um, the chair would like to have a motion uh, to instruct the superintendent to go forward with further investigation based upon the recommendations that he has made to us with a time certain uh, to respond back to us by that uh, April 8th meeting. Is there such a motion for that? Mr. Chairman, I'll make that as a motion. Okay, motion made by Mr. Nodquist. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Second by Mr. Cludio. Any further discussion on it? Okay, uh, um, the motion is from the committee to instruct the superintendent uh, to continue with his investigation based upon the recommendations that he has given us and to be able to report back with a recommendation, yay or, no, uh, or nay, on April 8th. And we'll put this to rest at that point, and uh, then we'll go to a public hearing if it's a, if it's a positive. Can I just have clarification? Will the public hearing be before the 8th? I I'm sorry, I'm confused. Before the 8th or after the 8th? I I'm public just... I, I, uh, I would say after, but that's the call of the committee. I, I, we would so hope there would be no vote after taken we have on the 8th. Uh, I, I would say that we hold a public hearing after we find out if it's feasible. Yeah. We, uh, do we okay. want to consider doing it the same night mm. that uh, we get the uh, request, or do you want to set another meeting to... Uh, what about, do we have a second meeting in April? No. Well, could you your call, to... Mr. Chairman. Mr. Superintendent, do you have any preference? For the meeting date? Uh, do you, uh, are you interested in having a public hearing on the same date that you're going to report back to us? as to the, the uh, feasibility of this? Uh, uh, to be to quite say. honest, I'd rather have the committee deliberate on, um, because it could be a series of proposals. Okay. So, so I, I would prefer that the committee deal with it and then go forward to a public hearing. Why don't we, we'll plan on, on uh, scheduling a, a second school committee meeting for April. I'll check with the members uh, for availability. We'll get a, we'll get a time that uh, everyone uh -huh. can be present at. Okay. We all set, Martha, with motion, seconds, and votes on that? Okay. All right. Uh, next uh, item is FY15 budget uh, review. Dr. Malvey? Uh, I put that item on the agenda to see if there was uh, any further discussion that the committee wanted to hold specifically on the uh, FY15 budget as it currently stands. Um, we have made it public. You've had your public hearing. The committee has adopted it. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Julie, in the amount of $24,151,795. Um, uh, if there's any further need uh, for the committee to comment uh, on it or ask administration uh, to come up with additional information, that's number one. Number two, as part of the FY15 budget, I would ask the committee for further consideration on the capital uh, outlay piece relative to the technology issues that we have identified for the committee. And last evening, we had some conversation with the Spencer Board of Selectmen and Finance Committee that there seemed to be some sensitivity of whether that item that request, and I believe it's uh, in the amount of $632,000, uh, whether the school committee wants to officially move that forward for consideration at the town meeting. And then I have another piece as a uh, uh, corollary to the FY15 budget relative to technology, but I would like uh, any uh, comment relative to those two issues. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Malby. Uh, this issue was addressed uh, last night. Uh, Mr. Cloutier and I uh, attended with Dr. Malvey and uh, with uh, Julie, the business manager, with the Spencer Selectman. And uh, we made them aware of the problem that we're running into uh, uh, with our technology as of uh, early April. And the ticket number is large, as you know, and uh, there is no room in our budget to address it. But we're going to um, enter into a very serious uh, field where information can be compromised 
and uh, privacy on some issues may be jeopardized. And uh, we made the selectmen and the town manager aware of that. And uh, I asked them uh, what their feeling was if the committee were to come up with a ballot question uh, for a debt exclusion, which would be a one-time, if approved, temporary increase on the tax rate that would allow us the funds to be able to allow Dr. Malvey to ensure the administration will be able to continue uh, to do what they have to do and that all the information that needs to be uh, remain public and, and sensitive can remain that way. Otherwise, we're going to have some massive changes and shutdowns of a lot of the, um, the equipment that we're currently using. So I, I bring that up uh, just for discussion from the board, uh, because if, if you have um, uh, some uh, uh, idea that you would like to support that, uh, then it's something that uh, we should probably put a, a dollar figure on tonight and uh, approve with a motion and send to them uh, so that uh, we meet their time frame requirements uh, because they're looking, I, I believe, to be closing on the 8th. Uh, so um, uh, I, I think it's probably the only opportunity that we're going to have uh, to give the district an opportunity to address uh, those technology needs. Does anybody have any comments or thoughts in regards to that? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Donakowicz. Uh, what is the, is the dollar figure on that? Uh I think Dr. Malby has indicated it's around 632,000, and um, uh, that would be as a debt exclusion article, and I would say we're probably looking at an impact uh, perhaps around 50 cents uh, for a year. Anybody agree with that? Uh, Mr. Cloutier, would you guess would be in that ballpark? Or? I think it's somewhere in that area. I'm Some, not sure exactly. Right. But, but that's something for our town fathers to... Uh, figure and calculate out. I think the issue before us is we've got a serious problem. Uh, Dr. Malvey can speak to it to a little bit more in length if, if you'd like to so that everyone <coughs> really understands it. But uh, if, we, if we don't at least take the opportunity and go forward, I don't think we have anything to lose. Voters will either say yes or no. Uh, otherwise, I don't know how we address an issue of that larger number given the constraints that we have financially. But uh, Dr. Malvey, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Or? Well, um, it's one of these things that uh, if, if we as a district don't move sooner or later, uh, we're going to grind to a halt on our existing systems. I've said a number of occasions that given the equipment that we have, the units that we do have throughout the district, elementary up on to high school, we have um, uh, a tad over 800 units, if you will, but they're all outdated and cannot be further um, rebuilt, if you will, when they break down. The um, issue that we are confronted with, as every other school district and anyone else that has uh, computers that operate with the XP system as their operating system, XP technically goes out of business come April 8. We'll still be able to run our computers, but we won't have the backup, we won't have the support, we won't have the assistance uh, when something goes wrong. And we start to uh, expose ourselves from a security breach, a potential security breach on data that uh, heretofore we've been able to protect. We have certain legal requirements because of uh, student information, staff information, um, health information, et cetera, et cetera, the gamut goes on and on and on, that uh, in a flash, when we don't have the backup and the protection uh, through this, and it's a Microsoft issue um, providing XP throughout the country, uh, that we become exposed very, very quickly. Um, we're going to have to start shutting down our systems and limiting the access from an administrative standpoint and from an instructional standpoint with teachers. We're looking at approximately seven weeks to get to the end of the year to close out this school year from April 8 on. It's going to be virtually impossible for us to secure that environment and put yourself in the shoes of uh, particularly teachers where we tell them that no longer can they operate certain uh, systems and programs and a complete shutdown of accessing the internet. 
uh, they'll have to shift back to the, the old ways, so to speak. And given where we're at with seven weeks left, that's going to cause uh, some real difficulty for people to shift. And the students, I'm sure, uh, are not going to be too pleased. So what we're asking the school committee is for that support to move the issue forward because we have no choice in this school district. They're going to run out of uh, uh, their usefulness. Uh, we're already run out of uh, patching um, units uh, that have broken down through the course of the year. I have an alternate plan for the committee to try to do something immediately that I'll bring up after we deal with this issue, but the main piece is that we need to act on this sooner or later. The sooner would be now to move it forward, and we take our chances with the respective towns. If we're not successful there, it doesn't solve our problem, and I will be coming back with further recommendations because we can not uh, put this in the bottom drawer and think that it will go away. It's there to stay. Most school districts that I'm familiar with have uh, begun the upgrade process, but they've had a different financial situation that they've been able to address this over the course of the last year and two. Uh, very recently, we had a very productive meeting with a group of professionals in the community through what we call a CVTE uh, committee, and that stands for Career Vocational Technical Education Committee. And it's made up, I believe, of some uh, accomplished people, um, COO of uh, Flexcon, um, the, um, the director of uh, CLEMS, um, the technology person, the Vice President for Technology that handles uh, credit unions throughout the country, and several individual uh, technology companies that uh, are independent. And we, when we reviewed this situation with them and what their advice would be, the answer, uh, I can't repeat publicly, but the answer was, uh, you folks are in heap big trouble because they, on the business end, have already started to move, and then obviously the clients that they have, they've moved those clients to either newer systems or upgrades, giving the units that um, their you know, clients had. So they, they had no recommendations. Uh, could we temporarily fix this? Could we patch it some way? And if that's coming from the folks that uh, you know, um, um, eat, drink, and uh, sleep this uh, stuff, uh, then we truly are in heap big trouble. So we need to move forward uh, rather quickly. Um, I can apologize. Uh, that uh, we weren't able, as a school district, uh, to advance this issue uh, earlier. It should have been done, but I certainly can go back to um, my predecessors that they didn't have the financial means then, so now's the time to uh, face the issue and something really needs to be done. Any, uh, uh, Dr. Mel, in light of that, is this something that, um, uh, on, from what you've been told, uh, do we need to try to go forward and address the full amount, the whole problem at once, or is it something that could be done in, in a... In uh, this 632 would take care of, uh, I believe, up to half, a little better than half of what our issues are. And so it kind of would be a, a first wave. Um, there could be a second and a third stage, again, as we look at the overall financial picture of the operating budget and then certainly from the town perspective. But uh, in my meeting today with uh, the technology folks, um, I think things will change a little bit because even though we currently have over 800 computers in the district, they believe that they can scale that back somewhat as we go forward with newer um, systems, if you will, and even some potential upgrades here on a small number of them that I'll bring forward in a few minutes. So, so I think it would be a very, very good start and get us down the road and help us to lessen the impact uh, if we have to have a, a phase two and a phase three. Thank you. Uh, are there any uh, questions or comments from members? If not, is there any, uh, any uh, motions? Uh Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to make a motion, seeing what Dr. Maui says, to go for uh, a debt exclusion for technology for $632,000 so he can get it on a ballot. 
A motion made by uh, Mr. Nodquist. Is there second. a second? Second by Mr. King. Okay, second. Any further discussion? Uh, if I may, with the uh, motion is um, approval that uh, not only a debt exclusion, but uh, for purposes of procedural, that it be put on a capital request to the respective towns. Mr. If the committee um, would accept that through the motion. Mm -hmm. Chairman, uh, I did check with the town of Spencer, and they already did their capitals for this year, so it's closed. There's no more capitals this year, so if we're going to go forward, I think this is the only way to go. I don't know about East Brookfield, but uh, I did talk to Spencer. They already made their capital request, and it's already been appropriated, so... Uh, I guess the money's been spent as far as the capital goes for the town of Spencer. Okay. Um, uh, it's being suggested, Mr. Nordquist, uh, it will have no effect on what we're doing, but uh, would you be willing to amend the motion just for procedural matters that we'll send this as well to the capital request? And at least should this not get approved by voters, at least they'll have our request to be in line uh, for next year. Okay, I'll make that as an amendment that... Uh, the Code of Capital, uh, Capital Improvement Committee. Oh, okay, Capital Improvement, and then uh, with the discussion question also. Is is there a second to that motion? Second. Seconded by Mr. King. Any further? And, and if I may, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Kurt, for that. That's just a procedural thing that it doesn't. Uh, we have a two-pronged approach now, all right? Because we heard, I think we heard a little bit different. Uh, information last evening, but at least we've got uh, both bases covered now. Thank you. If I may, uh, I think we asked this before, Mr. Fayad. You, uh, East Brook doesn't have a capital committee, right? It's done through the selectmen. Okay, so um, we would send that to, send that to the selectmen in East Brook. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, uh, Mr. Goudia. <clears throat> I know we're talking about the 632,000, and we're talking in, in hearing Dr. Malvey speak, he's saying that so solves about half of the problem. I really think we need to get our hands around what the rest of the the other half of that is and uh, and be able to put a number to it because I wouldn't want to mislead the voters that uh, this solves the problem because there will be a round two because I don't see next year uh, this district having six hundred and thirty two thousand dollars to throw at at uh, technology and this is not something that can just wait so I just think we need to be right out in front of this thing that really the number of 632 is about half of what we need. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the superintendent's indicated that might even, might even be a bit a tad more than that, mm -hmm. that, that there may be a third round to it or close to a third round. Potentially. Potential. I think potentially. I, th I think in reality we need to get our hands around what that total number is. Uh, I will support this motion, but I think we need to really ask the administration to come back at our next meeting with that, uh, a better handle on what the totality of this issue is. Would the board be comfortable with going forward with this number just so that we can have our spot to be able to have the question on and in the meantime uh, direct the superintendent to, to get a, a more final number for us overall? Yes. Is that acceptable? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, any further discussion? If not, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Yeah. That doesn't require a roll call vote, does it? Or, no. no. Okay. No. Right. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda is hearing for visitors. Uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman, yep. uh, on the follow-up to that, uh, it's not an agenda item, but it deals with this issue on the technology. Uh, based on uh, my meeting uh, today with the technology folks, um, and because of the immediacy of this issue, where we're fast approaching April 8th, we have to make sure that we're operable from a financial standpoint and an administrative standpoint to run the district and to run the schools. And we also um, want to be able to run some semblance of computer operations for the teachers and for the students. So what the technology folks, uh, at my request uh, over the past week, what they brought to me this morning was that uh, as they um, re-reviewed the units that we have, of the over 800, they have identified a potential 245 computers that might possibly be upgradable if we're to go, if we're able to uh, find the money 
uh, to go with some new systems. That would be new drives, um, new memory, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, when we costed that out, it was going to be uh, well over $100,000, of which tonight I don't have, but we uh, scrubbed the numbers today, and through Julie's good work, we went into the technology operating budget, and we believe that we can uncover approximately six, I'm sorry, $56,000, it's 55 and some change, but we believe that we can recover that because we have frozen just about all expenditures in the district going back to the fall. We've been very conservative on our purchases, and we've also, in the technology arena, have held off on a personnel position, hoping that we could get a little further down into the school year. And here we are very close to the fourth quarter, April just around the corner. So I'm comfortable that we would be able to uh, access that money with no great risk to our basic technology operations. And in the absence of that, um, you know, come April 9, 10, 11, and so forth, uh, we, we may uh, have to shut down. But my point is that I believe we have the avail availability of that money. And even though we don't have it on the budget this evening, it would require a, uh, an approval vote for the committee to transfer it. And then I would have to pass it on to the commissioner for approval. But I'm asking the committee that in the absence of any objection to that coming forward at the next meeting as an agenda item, that would give me the permissibility to go forward and move on this item, and the committee would just hold their vote in abeyance until the next meeting. So I'm not asking you to vote. I'm just asking you in the absence of an objection to do that, in that I'm laying it out of how I would then proceed. It can be a win-win proposition. That is, we have the money. The committee eventually would have to take a vote on it because I cannot do it unilaterally. And I'm sure the commissioner would go along with it because it's coming from the technology arena, right from the, the get-go. And we'd be able to move forward. We're looking at anywhere from a four to 10 day window to get the uh, material that we need to upgrade approximately 245 computers which is the number of the 245 that could potentially be upgradable. Over and above that, the other units that I would like to see that gets us well over the $100,000 mark, I will look to see if we can do that at a future date. But I am not comfortable this <coughs> evening asking for the same vote of endorsement, not vote, the same endorsement, if you will, by not objecting. Does that make sense? Any any uh, comments or questions from members Mr. in regards to uh, what Dr. Melvin just said? Uh, Mr. Nodquist. I just want to say thanks to Julie on, on, on behalf of the board, but myself. Uh, you did an outstanding job since she came here, and and uh, finding money, that's that's a real plus. So I want to say thank you as a school committee member, and I'm sure for, for the rest of the board. Thank you, Julie. Any other uh, any questions or comments? In Regards to what Dr. Malby just said. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cloutier. I'd just like to know what account numbers this is coming out of, please. Julie, can you uh, handle that? This is the copy of it's basically the expenditure report line. So currently, exactly, it should be the same as your last expenditure okay. report, but this is currently where we stand. Judy, we, uh, okay. Julie, would you just hold on a second, okay. please, until everybody gets their copies and start over from the beginning? Okay. Everybody all set? Yep. Okay. Okay. So the first sheet was the, the budget transfer that we'd be requesting. The second sheet is just um, what's currently in those accounts and what we're looking to transfer and what the balances are and what we're looking to actually spend the 40,000 and the 15. So those would be what we need to spend to upgrade the 245 computers. And this is basically taking all the money from all of our little lines, 1,500, 1,500 across the board to get the 55,000. Does anyone have any specific questions or? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Claudia. <clears throat> Through you to the uh, superintendent, Dr. Malvi. Is, is it possible that we could utilize uh, some of the $120,000 uh, 
uh, funds that were put aside in that stabilization account by the Commission of Education for this? No, not at the current time. But I will also tell you that as we move into the fourth quarter, if um, we're clear on the horizon for the potential liabilities that are identified for the commissioner, I will be making a move to the commissioner that we can redirect that money elsewhere in the budget, and then it could become available, but right now it's not. Uh, okay, and I, I know you shared this last night at the selectmen's meeting, but I didn't write it down. What, what's the balance roughly of that account at this point? of that $120,000 contingency account? Uh, I'm going to say upwards of uh, $80,000 thereabouts. Julie, does that sound close? Uh, 82000 82000 thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? And, and I, I just want to caution that we still have some um, outstanding liabilities with it that I don't think will we'll drain it down or drain it out, but there's still some uh, payments that will have to be made, but I still think we're within uh, shooting range that we might be able to recover that. Okay. Any other comments or questions in regards to this matter? If not, uh, what's the feeling of the board? We won't take a vote, but uh, do you wish to have the superintendent proceed with this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I certainly support it. Okay. Anybody in objection to it? Okay, Dr. Malvi, uh, if you would like to proceed and uh, uh, we'll address this at the next meeting. On behalf of the administration, staff, and students, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, finally, now the next <laughs> hearing for visitors, last item on the agenda. Anybody? Mrs. McDevitt? I just want to mention, Mr. Cloutier, when you said you want a level playing field. I'm 69 years old. I'm 11 years retired. Many people that sat in these seats tonight were my teachers. And they were the best of the best. They taught us well. And many of us went into education. And I feel I did a good job as an educator because of them. They made a lot less money than I made and that current salaries. And to do a level playing field, some of them weren't even here because they just had surgeries. And some of them that were here were, were ill. And it can't be a level playing field. And I think we are doing a disservice to those people. Mm -hmm. Anyone else uh, wishing to be heard? Mr. Fair? Sure, yeah. Um, I just have a, a couple questions or things I'd like to have clarified that have to do with the discussion about the closing of Lake Street. Uh, I did, if, if you mentioned it, I missed it. Is there a specific time frame that you're looking at? In other words, are you shooting for this coming September? to make this happen? Uh, Dr. Melby, you want to address that? Uh, I would, uh, my, my first uh, pass at it, uh, Mr. Fayad, would be to see conceptually and pragmatically whether it could be done. And then the next piece would be, could it be done for the beginning of the school year? And if not, then stretch that out to when would be the best time for it. Uh, so I've not made up my mind yet because I don't have uh, the solid information that I'm asking um, the leave of the committee to do that, and that's what they agreed to this evening. Okay. But that's, that's my approach to it. Well, with all due respect, Dr. Melvi, uh, you mentioned that you, you, know, you had seen and been involved in a number of reorganizations. And since this came up, I've spent a little time on the Google myself, and there are a lot of good studies out there where school districts hired consultants to study an issue like this, not just willy-nilly say we have the space here and we have the space there and we can cram little kids into the high school and for what? To close a building that you may find if you do your jobs and you get students coming back to our district, you'll need that space. To go back to someone that I don't quote often, Dr. Hicks, 
Once you close it, it's closed. You will never open that school again. So I would like to recommend that you, and again, I know you have a lot of experience, sir, but these people don't. And they don't know what the ramifications might be down the road from this kind of an action. And I would also like you to ask you to clarify in your uh, bullet point recommendations, you mentioned something about the uh, East Brookfield Elementary School, and I didn't quite hear exactly what you said. That I don't know if you meant that there would be no, no impact on East Brookfield or whether it was potentially <clears throat> Part of the reorganization. Uh, specifically, what I was referring to, uh, Leo, was um, um, request the administration to attempt to minimize, attempt to minimize the impact of any changes on the East Brookfield Elementary students with respect to being assigned to other district schools. So I will do my best to minimize that, but in all reality, I will also. Uh, put it out there um, of, of an option that would impact the students at East Brookfield Elementary School. But I think where I'm heading with it is that I can lay out a couple different scenarios to try to minimize it, maybe not even have any impact, but I also, because of where the committee has in previous discussions talked about uh, the potential of uh, uh, moving um, East Brookfield students, um, particularly uh, grade six as an example, but it could end up, uh, as part of my review, we might take a look at kindergarten. Now, I'm not saying that's the way we're going to go, but that's the purpose of that statement so that at least it lets people know that that still is a possibility, but I'm trying to minimize it and in the end, if it can be um, done away with, then that can be, become part of the conversation too. And one last thing I'd like to ask through the chair. What is this committee's interpretation of the regional agreement relative to moving K through six students from one district to another? And, my, and I don't only reference this from an East Brookfield perspective. I'm sure there are parents in Spencer who would like to be sure their kids are going to be close to home when they're that young. So I'd just like to know, for the record, do you believe this is something the school committee can just mandate or dictate? or will it require an amendment to the regional agreement? Dr. Melby? I'm asking the school committee's opinion. Uh, we are going to follow whatever the requirement is of the superintendent. I think he made it clear uh, that we will go through legal counsel and we will do what is, whatever is legally proper to be done, and that's what we'll follow. And the agreement will speak for itself. I, I, have no I mean, it's, that's my own. I haven't read it. Repeat that. Explanation. Go ahead. Uh, if, unless the committee wants to make a comment, I'd be happy to, to re-clarify uh, the way I see that going, and that's based on the agreement, but committee first. The way that I interpret the, the regional agreement is to, let me, I wrote a little note. The first part of the regional agreement, it clearly states, and this is basically a language, I think a language interpretation, it can be interpreted any way. The first part of the agreement, it clearly states plural. It states students. When you get to section 14 of the regional agreement, it's where it says a particular pupil will be able to attend a school in another district um, with the vote of a six, to seven, six of the seven members. It's the way you want to interpret it. My interpretation of that is you can't move an entire grade. You can move an individual student, which we have in the past, um, but I did also hear Dr. Malby say that he would be looking into the regional agreement and whether or not it did have to be amended earlier. I don't know if that answers your question or what my... Well, if that's the case and you're going to be asking your counsel for an opinion on that, I, I'd like to see that be done sooner than later, maybe before your public hearing. And we'll bring our... Um, Opinion from our council at that time too. Right. If if you want to, I'll just stay there for a second. But let me take another crack at it. What I was referring to, and what Mary was getting to, so I'll repeat that at the end. But uh, the provisions in the agreement allow the um, um, the um, the uh, town meetings uh, to come up with a proposed amendment that then needs to be acted upon. 
there's another provision that allows the school committee to initiate an amendment to the regional agreement. There's a, another provision that allows 10% of residents in either town to initiate an amendment. And then back to the piece that Mary was mentioning, there's a section that talks about the school committee having the authority by six of the seven members voting to transfer students. But that, I believe, historically has been interpreted for a student or two, and the practice has been consistent through the years, and we've even done it once or twice in this current school year. But it, I believe, um, is defined as uh, the movement of, you know, maybe a few students or a handful, not a class or not an entire grade range. But there is a piece there that talks about six an affirmative vote of six of the seven members, and that's what you were referring to, Mary. Correct. Thank you. Okay. I just want to say, it, I'm not totally against looking at these kind of things, but to do it in a reactionary way, just like you did last year with moving the sixth grade and closing Ma Maple Street, because the, that school had been talked about being closed for five or six years, and until the boiler blew up, that's when we made a decision to do it. Okay, And, and I just don't want to see something this big be done on that short a time schedule. Thank you, Leo. Is there anyone else? Uh, man? Just give you a name, please, when you get to the mic. Hi, Carrie Ferreira. Just a couple things that you need to also look at into closing Lake Street School and moving the children is you got to look at it from a preschooler's perspective, okay? And like, like he said, you move kids to a different facility that's not meant for them. These kids got to use the bathroom. They got to have lunches, you know, and you got to like incorporate lunches and move everything around. And the cost that it's going to be to renovate a facility to be able to have these younger children come in. You know, that's something you got to look at too because, yeah, you're not going to save $400,000. You're going to have to spend money to move these kids. And that's only part of the thing. People think that they're going to save money, you know, and they're not because if you close the school, it's going to become the town's problem. And then people are going to end up paying for the school anyways because they're going to have to pay for upkeep of the school because it's a building and it's going to be the town's problem, you know. And then think about the emotional effect that this would have on the kids too. All right, because these preschoolers, they were up at Maple Street School. All right, now they're at Lake Street School. They're looking for a place to stay for a few years to get a, get a sense of something. All right, because then, you know, you're going to move them again? I mean, gosh, give the kids a chance to, you know, you know. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh but please, do look into that, how much it's going to cost. Because, like I said, there is costs associated with it. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to? Yes? Hi, I'm Jane Hildick. I'm uh, one of the integrated preschool teachers at Lake Street School. And I, I understand uh, the whole plight of saving money, but I also want to spin off of Ms. Ferreira's um, comments and say that um, when I started at Cubs Corner, there was one preschool, then there was two, now there's three, then there was four, now there's four. And um, it's a great program, and there's a lot of reservation from parents saying that if these kids are going to be at the high school where there were two lockdowns just this school year, how's that going to affect, you know, preschoolers being there? Um, and it's a self-sustaining program because the special ed students are federally mandated, so the other students are starting to leave because, you know, they're, they're paying and they don't want to come somewhere where they're feeling like it's not a priority or they're not safe. So just another thought. Thank you. Anyone else like to be heard? Okay, yes, Debbie.
I know I wasn't asked to prepare anything or say anything for tonight, but um, as I was sitting there, I'm take, taking down some notes. So I'd just like to say a few things about my thoughts. Um, we do have 15 classrooms at Lake Street School that are utilized. There's four preschool, six kindergarten, and five first grade. Besides that, for those of you who haven't been inside the school, we have the computer room, an art room, the music room, the library. We have a combined multi-purpose room. It's the gym, the cafeteria. We have an OT, PT room, an Oasis room, which is used as an applied behavioral room, a diapering room, the Head Start classroom. So there's 15 rooms start growing. We have a speech office, a counseling office, a title room, a sped room, a combined speech room, leveled library, the teacher's room, an adaptive phys ed room, a conference room, a Head Start office, and then the nurse's office, the main office. Um, we don't have one extra bit of space right now. So with that being said, I'm jotting down a few questions of my own. If we were to, get, to combine these children, how would all the teachers get their daily prep periods? Contractually, they get five a week. If you have been in the building with these little people, they're three, four, five-year-olds. Lunch is a big process. Um, will this be doable when more grades are combined? Will the playground be beneficial to these younger children? Will the facilities be suitable, like Carrie just said, for three, four, five-year-olds? I was thinking they were maybe coming to Wire Village and thinking about the toilets, the sinks. If these children are now going to the high school or to Knox Trail, we're going to have to look at all these facilities. If I had a three-year-old, would I want them to be with sixth, seventh, eighth graders? If I had a five-year-old, would I want them to be at the high school? We have a large population of children re receiving special ed services. Um, will we be so crowded that services such as adaptive phys ed, OT, and PT will once again have to utilize the hallway? When I first started at Lake Street, they were doing services in the hallway. Um, we currently have a wonderful room that OT and PT utilize. Um, they have a foam ball pit. They have a relaxation swing. Are all these services that are beneficial to these children going to have to be taken away? Uh, I, I think of it as a parent. 20 years ago, my own child had to receive speech services uh, in the Dudley school system. I would be appalled if he had to receive these services when he was three, four years old in a room that was so crowded with other people that are doing speech, OT, PT, because there, there were times when I first started here that these services were combined. So as a parent, I think that would, that, that would you know, be appalling to me. So these are just a few of my many concerns that I was jotting down. And I am sure that my staff at Lake Street School would welcome all of you to come in to see what they do on a daily basis with the lack of supplies. And it looks on paper like we have a large staff. But when you see the issues that some of these children come with them, these three and four, five-year-olds, we welcome you to come into our school. Um, they make Lake Street School a safe and nurturing place for our children. And I would hope that you do not make a hasty decision regarding our students, because they truly are our future. Thank you. Anyone else uh, that would like to be recognized? She Nobody? Leaving. No, OK. She's there. She's leaving, yeah. All right, seeing no other hands, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn, Mr. Chairman. Motion adjourned by Mr. Nodge. What's the second? Second. Second by Mr. Cloutier. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed?